So we can't see you. All we can see is the lights, and there, there are several of those. So a, apologies if, if we don't make good eye contact. Um, how's everybody doing? Good, good morning sessions? Yes? Um, and then we've stuffed your mouths with food so you can't compete with us. Um, so that's good timing in terms of lunch. Uh, my name is Thomas Walker, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs and LGBTIQA Services at the University of Denver across town. Um, and I am really excited to be here and honored uh, to get to uh, learn with everybody here today um, and uh, to share the stage uh, with um, some role models um, and uh, activists and educators um, to get us thinking about um, intersectionality. And I was kind of laughing backstage as we were talking. Um, Dr. Cross, also from University of Denver, um, seemed to say that intersectionality wasn't the best thing this morning. Um, and then Marsha actually was one of the folks who asked, wait, can you clarify that a little bit? Um, and while he was she talking, was she was on it, was right there on it. So uh, that, that's a good sign, I think. Um, and again, he was talking about that if you go too far down the I'm all these things, that, that can, can, can water down stuff. Um, but intersectionality in and of itself, thinking about ourselves as complex people and focusing on a few, um, is actually really important in the work so that we don't get stuck in single issue um, uh, activism because there are no single issue lives. Um, somebody important said that, I'm forgetting who that was, but um, uh, that's definitely out there. And so uh, what we're gonna do today is actually have a conversation um, and we will have a, few, a little bit of time at the end um, for questions and answers um, with, our, with our panelists. Um, but my job um, is to model as a cisgender white guy to say as little as possible and to take as little space as possible. Uh, uh, and as someone who's a chatty introvert and a trainer, to give me a room full of people, uh, my inclination is to fill it with my stories. And so um, I'm going to name that challenge and put that challenge out there um, in the spirit of the day for all of us to take advantage of a really rare opportunity we have um, to, to, to learn from and learn with our panelists who are going to introduce themselves in a second. But that intersection for today, um, and um, both of them have asked me about this, is how did we get to Asian Pacific Islanders talking about trans issues that, that never happens. Was it, you know, what was the, what was the circumstance of that? Was that happenstance? The answer is no, it wasn't. Um, this is an opportunity for us to actually um, look at those intersections um, and talk about some issues um, and some voices that don't often get heard as much, particularly in the middle of the country. And so that's kind of some of the justification um, and idea behind today is to really look at those intersections, complicate the idea, uh, and as one student said, it's not just trans or not just API. And so we really have a rare treat to, to, to spend a little time at that intersection. So what I'm gonna do is ask our panelists to um, introduce themselves. You've got the full bio um, in your, um, in your program, they're going to spend a few minutes just giving us a little bit about their story, and then we want to have a conversation, and then we'll loop you into that as well. How's that work? Sound good? Okay. So um, I want you to give me a big hand in welcoming uh, Gina Rosero and Marsha Izumi. We have so, so much love here already. <laughs> well, first, um, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's my first time in Colorado. <laughs> What a way to be welcome. <laughs> I was at the Red Rocks uh, amphitheater. amphitheater yesterday. It was so beautiful. I, I, I can't wait to come back. Well, about me, um, first, certainly when I enter spaces, I, you know, I love to acknowledge those intersecting identities that I carry with me because those are the lens that I operate in the world, the way I inhabit spaces, and the way I take pride in those identities. I am a proud transgender woman of color. I am from the Philippines, born and raised in the Philippines. I'm an immigrant. I'm a daughter. I'm a goddess. <laughs> I'd like to say that. <laughs> Trans people are considered goddess back in the end. We could definitely go into that. But so, you know, being someone who's born and raised in the Philippines, you know, at such a young age, because of the culture that we've had in the Philippines of visibility for trans people, I was exposed to you know, trans people at a young age. I started joining transgender beauty pageants at uh, 15 years old. And at 17, um, I had the opportunity to move to the United States. So I moved here to be with my family in San Francisco. And then, you know, around that time, you know, from after doing pageants, I, I realized maybe I could be a model. Why not? I've always loved Naomi Campbell back in the day. So again, why not? So in 2005, I made that decision to move to New York City not knowing pretty much anybody, right? And it's 
crazy me, I just wanted to be a model. So I made the decision to move to New York City, while at the same time, I made that conscious decision to not share my trans identity to my model agent. So, and I certainly acknowledge that's a big privilege in, in, in that in itself. But at the time, you know, there was not an out or successful or celebrated trans person. Um, so, you know, I, I, was, I was scared at that time. And so for almost a decade, I was a model in New York City and I wasn't out as a model. I wasn't professionally out. And I was out with my friends and they loved me, obviously. But, you know, professionally, I know when I look back, it held me back. So after living that life for almost a decade, I made that conscious decision to, I've had enough. Um, I've had enough to carrying that shame and always feeling like, what if somebody finds out what's going to happen to my life, what's going to happen to my career? I think, if you, do you guys know Carolyn Cosey? Does that ring a bell? She's a successful British model back in the early 90s, 80s. And when she was outed as a model, her career was over. Right, so in a way, when I was modeling in New York City, that was sort of like how I envisioned my life, what could potentially happen to me. Um, but, you know, I, I guess at a certain point, the sense of purpose was just so much bigger than my fear. And again, the crazy idea, if I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna come out and share my story, it has to be big. So I want to do it in a TED conference. So. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> so, yeah, I had the opportunity to share my story uh, two years ago at the TED conference, and luckily it's been you know, an amazing amount of support. I've also launched a, an advocacy and media production company called Gender Proud. Um, so, org. What's that? Genderproud.org. Genderproud.com. Dot com, sorry. And um, so that, sort of, yeah, that's, that's been the journey. I know we're going to get into so much of that, but I think the journey from like this little trans girl from the Philippines and now, you know, living in New York City and being here with you guys, sharing this story and owning that story and owning that narrative. I think what's, I, I, I look back on those moments, I think this is what it's about when we own those intersecting narratives that we've, how I grew up, you know, and the things that we don't really see a lot, right? And I love spending time with this woman. Oh, we always so see in like big events, but we never really get a chance to like chat and hang out and, oh. My mom has been a great cheer of my story, and she just told me basically she lives in LA. Every time I come to her LA, she will be my mom in LA. So uh, <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> Welcome, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Gina. Well, some of you, I think, heard my story yesterday. I'm going to just give a little brief uh, summary. I am the mother of a transgender son. Um, Aiden first came out as lesbian when he was 15, and that immediately put a target on his back. He was bullied, he was harassed, and after two years, he became agoraphobic, which meant he didn't feel safe in the world. And um, so he came home and said, I, I'm not going back to school. Um, he struggled from that point on. Um, he had a lot of offers because he was a good golfer and he had to turn them all down because he could not see himself going away to college. And his first semester, he uh, failed all his classes. And um, after that, shortly after that, he came out to me as transgender. And I wish I was a mother that said, I just loved my son and celebrated it, him, um, but I was scared. I was ashamed. I know Gina talks about shame. That's uh, something that's very Asian. And I, I'm sure there's other cultures that feel it, but in, in the Asian culture, there's a lot of shame and a lot of honor that's attached to our culture. So basically, my son came out of the closet, and I think I went into the closet because I was so ashamed. And, and the hard part was um, I was ashamed of being a mother, and I think my son thought I was ashamed of him, and I wasn't. Um, and so I think ours has been a journey of working through many of those negative feelings, uh, through the shame, uh, through the grief and the sadness of losing a daughter and gaining a son, 
um, of being fearful so much of my life when he was transitioning because I didn't think the world was safe for him as well. Um, and today, I think my shame really has turned into pride. I am so proud of my son. I am proud. <laughs> I'm so proud of all he's taken, all the struggle, all the challenges, um, and he hasn't let it beat him down. It's made him stronger. And I think I'm proud because he has um, been a role model for me of being my authentic and true self. Um, if you asked me six or seven years ago, would you be sitting on a stage like this talking to a large group of people like this, I would have said no. That's too scary. But I've learned I can be scared and I can be brave at the same time. Um, I've learned that even though um, I may think this is bigger than what I can do, if it's something that my heart says, you need to go do it anyway, I can do that. And I've learned that from my son. I've learned that I could grieve and be sad and that's okay, um, but my intention was to be the best mother and be most connected to my child. And so I went through that grieving and sad process, and I got to the other side, and I'm really very joyful of the life we've created. And I think finally all the fear that I had early on has really turned into um, me being hopeful um, and me being not totally unafraid, um, but I think I can say, look at myself and say, you know, you're kind of fearless today. <laughs> and before, I tell you, I was... <laughs> she is definitely fearless, that I know. No, I, she's there, like she, the work that you're doing, I mean, traveling around, you know, it, it's exhausting. You know, it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of energy when, when you share some of the most intimate emotional mm -hmm. moments the depth of that energy to, that you carry. So this woman is, it's a, it's, it's a woman that, that's just so brave and courageous to, to take on this, this issue, right, and, and share that. And certainly with this intersecting identities that carries with, with our culture that comes with that. I mean, she covered a little bit of that, and it's certainly true in where I grew up. I grew up Catholic, like intense Catholic, Philippines, intense Catholic, the only country in the world where you can't get divorced. So to carry that and to, to have this moment of, you know, narratives about being trans or LGBT, like it, it takes a lot. So this woman is courageous. So. Oh, thank you so much, Gina. It's amazing to be able to sit on a panel with her and have her just acknowledge the journey that I've gone through to get here. Um, and so, like for me, even though it was challenging and even though there were times I thought, what am I doing here and what am, you know, why is this happening to me? Today I look back and I think that this journey, this struggle, all the challenges that I've had have made me, my family, and, and my children who we are today. And so I look back really with gratitude for the opportunity to have grown into this person. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, I, I, Marcia, you mentioned, and I think Aiden has also talked about the, the cultural pieces about shame, um, about not talking about certain things, and we were talking backstage and not using up any good information, I promise. But I know, Gina, you had mentioned uh, a, a distinction we were talking about the, in the Philippines, the visibility of the trans community, um, but that's different from protection. Right. So um, I, I think that the being able to overcome that and, and be out and open is not necessarily everything. Would you mind saying a little bit more about sure. that? Sure. Backstage, a lot happened. <laughs> Lots of love, and that I could tell you. Um, I was showing them this video on my cell phone. On, I, my access to my identity and the community where I grew up in the Philippines was through transgender beauty pageants. It's, it's so mainstream in the Philippines that, you know, actually during the month of May, almost every day there's a transgender pageant that happens, whether it's down the street or television or a big coliseum. It's part of our culture. So it's really, it's, 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 
it's as mainstream, mainstream as possible. And I'd like to point it out, I think, you know, when we're talking about that, this is the perfect example and how it relates right now here in the United States that visibility is not enough at all. It has to be more than that. Because in the Philippines, it's culturally visible to be trans. Like, people know trans people in the Philippines. It's, it's all over. You see them all over. We're part of the society. But there's no political recognition. There's no rights. There's no policies. But interesting, when I moved to the United States, it's sort of like the other way around. Because when I was 17, when I got the phone call from my mom, who had moved to San Francisco, she told me that in California specifically, there's a policy that would allow me to change my name and gender marker on my driver's license. So even though I was, you know, 17 years old, I was the biggest diva in the Philippines joining transgender beauty pageants, all of a sudden the possibility of moving to the U.S., having that driver's license, the policy that would recognize the person that I am, the woman that I am, that was life-changing. So I made that decision to move to the U.S. But then when I moved to San Francisco, I was like, when am I going to join transgender beauty pageants on TV? Where, where is it? You know, there was nothing. So there was not a lot of that visibility. So all of a sudden, it was the other way around almost, right? That there's a policy recognition, but there's no cultural of visibility. So I think those two things are really interconnected, you know? And I think even with the work that I do with Gender Proud, you know, when we first launch, which is after I, I did the TED talk, I you know, worked with the UN and had the opportunity to meet you know, President Obama and speak at the, inside the White House, talk about my story. You know, those two things are very interconnected, like policy and culture has to go together. You know, you can't just talk about policy if you're not changing culture, and you can't just change culture, like in the Philippines, if there's no policy. You, that's not... You can't thrive in those right. conversations. And, and it's also what's happening now, we need to go and move beyond the conversation through survival. You know, we need, trans people need to thrive. And you do that by really digging through, by making sure we center the narratives of the most marginalized. My brothers and sisters, the last year has been the most violent in my community. I don't want to live in a society where if you're a person, trans person of color, your life expectancy is 35 years old, I don't want to live in, in that life. So the work that we do, the work that, we all have a role in, 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 to play in this, right? We cannot continue living that life. So yeah, it's interesting in, in that, you know, sort of east-west type of dynamic, it's, it's, but here's the crazy thing as well, it's almost like this, the biggest irony, this trans beauty pageant that happens in the Philippines, it happens during the religious celebration. It happens during the fiesta celebration. So it's like this irony of, of what is transgender beauty pageants in the Philippines. And obviously the West have a completely different notion. Hey, I'm, I'm a feminist, I'm a proud feminist. And most people in, in the United States, it's pageant, you know, it's sexist and all that. But in the Philippines, the way we looked at it, it's our economic empowerment. You know, because I joined so many pageants, I won a lot of money so I could buy my hormones and give some money to my sisters and brothers. So it was a different perspective, right, to come from the Philippines and to be here. So I've had that very complex relationship in expression and culture and the narratives. So, yeah. <laughs> so even within API, we get the national differences, another layer of identity that comes in. And it's, it's interesting to say, even in, in, in my TED talk, I mentioned that, that in, in, in Southeast Asian cultures specifically, we've had a long history of gender fluidity. It is so dominant, right? Like, obviously, we could easily talk about that here in the U.S., right? Colonization has a lot to do with that. In the Philippines, just like here in the U.S., right, before it was colonized, gender fluidity. Here in the U.S., uh, the two spirits um, are considered sacred and spiritual leaders. In the Philippines, we call it babaylan. We still have indigenous communities in the Philippines. That we call it teduray. Just imagine in the Philippines before Spain, because we were colonized by Spain for almost 400 years in 1521, before Spain got there, trans people are considered the spiritual leaders. We were the priests. So imagine when Spain got there, introduced 
religion. You could just imagine what happened to trans people. That same thing that happens all over the world. Colonization, if we're going to talk about the root of all these things, if we're going to, if we're going to unpack all of these things, critical analysis, it, we need to be able to talk about that. And even when in conversations, when it comes to, at least in the Filipino culture, that is deeply religious, we need to be able to talk about that because if we're going to display this respectability politics when it comes to our culture in the Philippines that is so embedded in religion, we can't move forward because all of those things is part of this historical narratives of colonization. So, so we got the visibility, the political piece, the historical context. And I know, Marcia, you were saying you, you also felt the, the need to add the family piece kind of in the, the mix of what we need. Yeah, I mean, I think the things that Gina talks about are really important, but what I see is uh, families are really important as well. And, and that's where my work is. I see so many young LGBTQ individuals in, in this work, and they haven't told their parents who they are. And you know, it makes me really sad to know that because I get to see my son do his work. I get to see how amazing he is because I'm part of his world. And I know it's not, um, it, it may not be the case for everybody to be able to do that. Um, but what I want to do is I want to create, especially in the API community that is so uh, into, let's not talk about anything that's difficult. Let's not talk about anything that could be shameful for our family. And so what they do is they feel alone, they feel isolated, and they feel like there's something so wrong about their child. And so I want to change that picture because these my child is so beautiful, and he is doing so many amazing things. And if I wasn't part of that world, the bottom line, I wouldn't see that maybe I'm kind of an amazing parent to have a <laughs> child like that. So I want other parents to see how amazing they are to have children that are doing this work and having this vision and being so courageous out there. Family dynamic is so, I mean, we were talking backstage as well, I mean, about my mom. I remember, especially after I, I, I did the TED Talk, which is like a big life-changing moment for me to finally just be like, I'm a proud transgender woman. It's as simple as that truth, right? But for the longest time, because of that shame. And then when I asked my mom, after finally, you know, accepting the fullness of, of my womanhood, I asked her, Mom, what do you think of that boy that you thought that you had? And she said, I felt like my little boy went on vacation and never came back. I was like, we're on vacation, okay. But you know, if you look a little bit deeper, right? I mean, trust me, we grew up poor, so we didn't like travel so much, you know, go on vacation, I was like. However, if you look a little deeper into that statement you know there's a sense of loss that parents feel right and that and i'm not judging my mom about that uh, that is her point of view i think the notion of expectations of what you know what your boy or the gender that you're assigned sex assigned at birth right it's those type of conversations that we need to have i mean and to, and to challenge that Right, the most fundamental expectation that parents and family members have for that little kid, and all of a sudden, oh, I'm not that gender that you thought that I am. It, it's a lot, it's a lot to carry, right? So we need to be able to have that space where, we, where, where family are allowed to, you know, there's a grieving process, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also, we need to go a little deeper because of those expectations that comes with it, right? And we were talking backstage, like sometimes I think about, you know, when a mom is pregnant and you, you know, you look at the ultrasound and you see it's a boy in the ultrasound and what's the first thing that's going to come to your mind, right? It's the expectation that, oh, my little boy is going to be married to a girl, he's going to be wearing blue, I'm going to paint the room uh, blue, all those like sort of expectations and gender labels that we put in and those boxes, right? And because for the longest time we've been, uh, you know, told and led to believe that gender is just this binary system. It is so not, and we know that. My existence is so not that, you know, her existence and the family and the many LGBTQ people that we know. 
So we need to be able to have really those conversations, even at the very beginning. And even was mentioning like, I've never been in a, in a family planning session or situation where I'm talking to a gynecologist and talking about that. Maybe that's sort of the conversation that we need to have with our gynecologists or people that talks about, like for parents specifically, like, these are also possibilities of gender, not just this boy or girl binary way of thinking about it, so. Yeah. Well, and it, Marcia, go ahead. Well, and I would love to see a world like that. I would love to see a world where um, my son doesn't have to always come out because I think that something, every time he goes to a new job, he has to question, you know, am I going to let them know I'm transgender or not? And um, now that he, my son is married, he was married in 2013, he's got a really wonderful wife, but I think their next um, coming out will be because they want to have children. How are they going to have that conversation? Um, you know, with their child as the child grows up. But maybe if there isn't all this binary and isn't all this, like it has to be this way and a family has to look this way and you have to have a mother and a father, then maybe it's just accepted and it just will be. So, I mean, I would love a world like that yeah. where people can just be seen as who they are, as beautiful and, um, as contributing to society in whatever way that is their gift, that would be, I think yesterday Dr. Martinez talked about a queer utopia. Wow, what a utopia that would be for my family and for my child. Can I have you say a little bit more, I, I think, we, a word to the health services folks in the, in the room. Um, with the family piece, uh, Marcia, you, I know, you have the, the trans individual having to have the coming out discussion with themselves, with the family and in different places. Um, but I know you're also involved with some, the Family is Still Family um, project. Um, yes. So what do you as a parent then talking to other family members? So it's not just the advocacy of the trans individuals themselves, but actually peer to peer in terms of parenting. Can you say a little bit more about some of the work you do with that? And again, yes. that's, that's back to one of the things you, you've stressed is really important. Right. You know, um, what I've heard for many families um, that have children that are LGBT is they really feel it's a choice. They feel like their child, especially those have, that have immigrated, came to the United States and they caught the gay disease or the transgender disease or, you know, whatever their child is. And so one of the things that we're trying to um, let people, let parents know is it's just who they, it's just how they were born. This is how your child was born. And you didn't do anything wrong as a parent because I thought, I had done many things wrong. Uh, my child actually, both of my children are adopted. And um, my son loved me so much um, as, a little, as a little child. And so I thought, I let him love me too much. Isn't that crazy? That I thought my child loved me too much and that's why he felt his attraction was to women. So, you know, I had to learn so much through this journey and, um, you know, I think those are some of the things that we're trying to help other families learn. Um, many families don't even have a language. They can't even speak, they can't speak English. So their children can't communicate. So this project that you're talking about, um, we have taken an English version of just some basic information for parents and translated it into 19 API, Asian Pacific Islander languages to help parents just understand at a basic level. Um, we've done, I think, nine PSAs, public service announcements, that are going around the country showing Asian parents who are proud of their children and saying, it doesn't matter, we just love our child. Um, so we are really trying to bring the message that um, it's not a choice, your child can be successful, um, and it's important that they have family support. I think your mom has made some phone calls yeah, to other I, moms. Is she, that right? My mom has been, so again, coming from a very traditional religious background, and people would ask my mom, how, how did you, you know, found the peace in, in accepting Gina as she is? because of religion and what they dictated back in the Philippines and you know this whole notion of gender binary and 
you're committing a sin and all that stuff, right? And my mom just basically, I just love her. Mm. I'm operating because of that. And that's enough, right? It, that's enough to know and the willingness for her to know more about my journey, to have that language that we could communicate. Like, I certainly, when I was, when I was five years old, when you know, I was wearing that T-shirt, I, I used to wear this T-shirt on my head or a towel, and I felt like that was my hair, and I would walk around the house feeling like it's my hair. And my mom asked me, why do you always wear that? It's like, Mom, this is, the, this is my hair. I'm a girl. You know, like certainly there's not a language to my mom at the time. Oh, you're trans. No, maybe she, my mom thought at the time I'm, I'm a gay boy, I'm being feminine. But that needed to develop, right? And, and that way of communicating with, with family members, with my cousins, and it's, it's true like constant engagement, right? And as much as in the Philippines we've had those visibility of trans people, it's still the language it's still, it's still not as fully developed. You know, there's some pageants in the Philippines that's still called Miss Gay Philippines, but it's all trans people. So language has to evolve, and that needs to be constantly challenged, that needs to be constantly, you know, engaged with the people, especially your family, your blood family, and your chosen family, so, yeah. And it's very interesting, you talked about faith. One of the, um things that happened to our family was my son was asked to leave the church he was going to. Mm. And, you know, it's really hard when your child is struggling, but the one truth he knows is that God loves him. And at the time um, when he was asked to leave the church, the message to him was that God did not love him. Um, he has not really stepped back into a church I, I don't think he's atheist. We've never really talked about it. I think he does believe in God. Um, but I think he doesn't want to go into a place that perhaps he could be rejected again. So faith does play an important part, I think, in family acceptance. We were not super religious, so it was not, uh, it was not a, a big deal for me to leave the church. But I know for some families, it really is an important community for them. And so for them, when they hear these messages, um, then they're, they're out of love. You know, when you hear your son is going to go to hell, or your daughter is going to go to hell, or your child's going to go to hell, then you don't want that to happen. So you do everything possible um, to not make it happen. But I heard this one mother, and it was just amazing. amazing. Somebody said that to her, and she says, well, if my son's going to hell, then I'm going with him. And I thought, oh my gosh, isn't that love? Isn't that really love that um, you'll stand by your child no matter where they go? And I thought that was so beautiful. Oh. <laughs> she said the best, you know, like I really, I'm, I'm taking you on in that mama in LA, so I'm gonna be in LA. <laughs> I have a Jewish mother in New York City. I have my mom in San Francisco. I now have, you guys are all witness. Yeah. <laughs> Chosen families, big. I know. And how proud I am to be your mom. <laughs> I love it. No, she's, um, I really thank you for having us here. Like, this is so special. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I know we're, um, I'm getting the, we're not done with time, but we want to make sure we leave some room for questions because I think we've got some, some in the audience. But one point, I know we talked a little bit about that I think it's really important. A lot of people around lots of issues think that you get the few people come out and the, the visibility is there and check, 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 you know, everything's fine. Or in the personal sense, you've come out once and now that we're, we're talking about the, the past. So I was wondering if you could each maybe say a little bit about, again, what's the ongoing and, and kind of what's coming up for the future, what you see is the continuing effort, um, not just telling the story of the past, but the work of, of going sure. forward. I mean, me personally, when I, when I did the TED Talk, the first thing that the organizers said, do not look at the comments, do not look at the comments, because <laughs> it's like, as much as it was like, it went viral and amazing, but the, the comments was like horrible. However, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've definitely learned to accept that it's part of the work, right? But what's also, the other side of it is like this sort of like this tokenizing component around it. Like I'm speaking, yes, I carry this identity with me, but trans people have such a diverse experience. I'm only speaking about my experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's important that when I come into a room where I'm the only Asia Pacific from the Philippines person, 
like I don't represent the whole diversity of like the trans people right, that, right, that, right. that have had a diverse experience. So I always need to make sure that I point that out. But I think what's also important, I mean, as a person who is, you know, as a model, but I'm now, you know, I have a production company, we produce <laughs> stories. I need to make sure that like when, when we're talking about the representation and visibility, no shade. I love obviously the movie, you know, Danish Girl and what's out there, but the, what we need to have is really trans people playing trans roles, trans people producing our own stories, you know, because you lose that nuance. And that's what we're all about. It's like when you get to those nuance, have you guys seen Her Story by Jen Richards online? There's another web series by my girl Jen Richards who produces Amazing Story full of nuance. When we produce stories with trans youth at Logo Channel, the nuance is what we're all about. Because we get to fully humanize trans people as people who are experiencing all of this complicated stuff in life, and we just happen to be trans, right? That's what I would like to see, and we're not going into this transition stories of like, did you have the surgery and all that stuff? Trust me, at a certain point, one thing I could really point out, especially as a person in the media and talking about these things all the time, at a certain point when you were always in media, right, and you already know like some of the questions, like at a certain point when you reach, a, at least in, in, in my situation, when I go to those interviews, I have a list of things I ain't talking about. No surgery questions. None of these things, because like, I need to get, be able to talk about the other complicated stuff, the humanizing component. And when it comes to these stories of coming out, great. It's really great. It's just one part of the, the, the conversation. I think when we get to be able to have story of a trans person as a president of the United States or a superhero trans woman in the Marvel comics, like, let's get there. Yeah, I know it sounds like a trans utopia, queer utopia, but. <laughs> let's get there. Let's get there, yeah. you know, like let's, and you know, everybody here has a, has a role, right? When we see again those, those, the usual stuff of surgery questions, let's move beyond that. Let's talk about the discrimination that happens in employment. Let's talk about the desire of trans people. Let's talk about men who love trans women without shaming them. Let's talk about all these things that are complicated. Complicated is good. It makes us think. So hopefully we have more of that. <laughs> and I think, you know, people probably recognize when a child comes out um, their parents have to come out as well. Their family has to come out. Um, and so I realize that what my son has gone through, the fear, the uncertainty, will I be rejected, um, losing everything that you love, your work, you know, the people around you. Um, and for me, that's a continuous process. Um, I feel like I have to come out a lot and that's why this queer utopia um, is so attractive to me because I wish I didn't have to spend energy on that, that it didn't have to be. And yet, that's been part of my growth. We were talking backstage a little bit and I said, every time I fly in a plane, I'm sitting next to a person and they say, oh, where did you come from? And I'll say, oh, Denver, oh, what were you doing there? And I think to myself, Am I going to say exactly what I was doing there, or am I not? How long is this flight? <laughs> you know, because that could be very uncomfortable. It's Who, very mom-like of her, right? Like yes. to figure out what. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this person that I'm sitting next to? Are they safe? Mm. Um, but I had an experience recently that was very interesting. I was sitting, uh, sitting next to a mother that she said she was Russian. And the first thing I thought was, oh, Russia, you know how they are about the LGBTQ community. Um, but I had only a one hour flight. <laughs> <laughs> so I made the decision to be what my, my uh, son says, mom, you gotta be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I thought, I can be uncomfortable for one hour. So I told her I was coming from Sacramento. I was speaking about family acceptance because I have a transgender son. And uh, she said to me, you know, I fled Russia because I was re uh, persecuted for my religion. 
So she goes, I know what it feels like to be persecuted. We're friends now on Facebook. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, and so I take calculated risks. And I think I will continue to, to take those risks um, because I believe the world can't be safer um, unless my voice is there for my son. And maybe I'm thinking, you know, I'm just one voice, right? But, but to me, I want my voice to be there. So as the world changes, I think, I was part of that change. Yes. You know, I helped to, to make this world for my son when I'm not here safer, that he can have a beautiful life because he's got a beautiful heart, um, and that he can live fulfilled um, and share his gifts with the world. Thank you both for that hard, good work <laughs> very much and for sharing with us today. I think we've got uh, a traveling mic to get a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and Jeremy, I'll let, I can't really see the hands, so I will let you find folks. Fashion yes. question? I'm a model. Yeah. <laughs> we were getting tips Vincent backstage shopping. too, actually. So it doesn't show, but we were getting them. Hi, um, my question to either of you is, when choosing to share your story or to be vulnerable with a stranger, what is the deciding factor? Is it who they are, where they come from, or is it based more on how you feel at the moment? I think Marsha, thank you for that question. I think Marsha just like pointed out those layered and complicated nuance, that choice. It is a choice, right? And it's. It's exhausting. I get to a certain point, you know, like, do I really need to explain this thing and all that stuff? I just did a speech. Am I going to have to explain it again, right? The calculated risk, you'll never really know, right? There's no way to figure it out. Certainly, you know, as a person who's been out there publicly talking a lot about these things and having that dialogue with someone, you could, I could already tell if that conversation, I need to end it and maybe talk about a different thing. But the reality is, it, it is exhausting, you know, at times. And I should be allowed to feel exhausted. She should be allowed to feel exhausted, right? Because, you know, to talk about the depths of those feelings and, and shame, and, you know, it's almost like public therapy, you know, like when you, when you go out there and you share some of these private, intimate things, right? So there is really no way how to gauge it. Certainly, you need to engage, and, you know, maybe after a few minutes, you could tell you know, how, where is this conversation going? So for me, there is no, how, how do I find out? I only find out by engaging, so. And I, I think I listen to my heart a lot. <clears throat> I listen, I, I pick up how I think the person will be, and I think I use this exhaustion piece also as a guide. If I'm, if I'm traveling a lot and speaking a lot and I'm really tired and I don't think I could you know, show up in a really good, positive, strong way, then maybe I just won't. So um, I think it is on a case-to-case -case basis, um, but I try to do it as much as I can because I feel that helps to educate. So thank you for your question. And it speaks to why it's important for more people to be having these conversations, not just leaving it to the few. Yes, yeah. I think that's a good point. Jeremy, I think, is that okay? Hi, um, so I have more. I just want to tell you a really quick story. And Gina, one of the reasons I came today is because I saw that you were speaking. Um, but I'm an ESL teacher, and um, for my students' homework, they always have to watch a TED Talk, and they can choose whatever they want. And every semester since I've done this, uh, a few students will choose your story. Oh. And, it, and if you haven't seen the TED Talk, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And the response is always the same. They said, this story gives me the courage to be who I am. Oh. And I want to share this with you. Oh. And it, it's absolutely amazing. No matter what their experience, what, whatever their story is, um, I think your story just speaks to everyone um, to, to be who you are. And so I just wanted to share that with you because I, I really appreciate it oh. um, and the message in your TED Talk. Thank you so much. Um, I look back, you know, Oh, she should be the one allowed to cry, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I look back on those things that I used to be so scared about, you know, and um, 
you know, what's going to happen in my career after I give this TED talk, you know, what, what, what are the repercussions, and, you know, when I hear those stories, when, and when I travel around and I hear what that talk has done for people, I knew I obviously made that right choice. Mm -hmm. Like, as much as it was, like, full of pain and suffering and shame, trust me, like, after I gave that TED talk, I was like, oh my God. There is no turning back here. <laughs> I, I can't tell Ted, like, do not leave this online, you know, because it was like, it was a box that I've opened up, you know, and I was so afraid for such a long time. And we were talking about eczema because <laughs> I think there, I had a moment where I become so sensitive about, like, stress. And before I did that TED talk, like months and months before that, I had so much eczema all over my body. I still have like some remnants somewhere here. And I realized, I remember I was in the dermatologist's office about, you know, how to treat this eczema. And I realized it sounds funny now, but I said, you know, I just need to honor this eczema <laughs> and be with it and accept it, you know. So those things, and I thank you for that. And it's really... I was so blessed to have that opportunity to, to be given that big platform on, on a TED Talk, so. And I appreciate it. I think we sometimes underestimate young people's ability to, to handle issues like this. And so again, that opportunity to, the exposure and the conversation to follow it up is really important. Jeremy, I think one more is there. Okay. So this question is specifically for Gina. I'm curious, before the TED Talk, um, you can negotiate life as a woman or perhaps an authentic woman and now being very publicly trans, um, negotiating as a trans woman. And I'm curious how that's changed from woman to trans woman in either self-identification or how others see you. Thank you, it's, it's very important. I, I will always say I'm a proud transgender woman for such a long time, that shame that I felt like I couldn't even say that. You know, and people would ask me sometimes, Gina, how do you want to be identified as a, do you want to be identified as a trans model or just a model, right? All those identifies that we carry with us. And I say, you know what? I call me a trans supermodel, trans model, because I want that young trans person somewhere in the world to see that there is a successful, out, celebrated, working model, a trans person. Because for the longest time, that sense of, you know, the image that I had, I never had that. And that's why I was, I was in the closet, because I never saw that. You know, Caroline Coase, I mean, this is before Andreja and Leah T and everything like that, right? This is in 2005 in New York City. There was not an out transgender person. So for that sense of purpose, for a young trans person anywhere in the world to see me in magazine, to see me in commercials and billboards, like, I want that. If that could change that one person's life, great. But as a woman, you know, the fullness of that womanhood, of that experience, it's freedom for me. It is freedom for me to fully accept all those things that I've gone through. Because for the longest time, I was not ready to accept that. For the longest time, and, and that obviously you know, applies to other layers of things that we were told to be ashamed about, whether it's our sexuality, whether it's our, the person we, we want to love, right? So I, a proud transgender woman of color. How's that? Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're going to wrap it up, but I know um, two of the busiest people, I think, on the planet sitting here on stage. Uh, any heads up about things to look for you in the future? I know um, I was going to mention Marsha's book. Um, is This is the Auraria Library copy, so it's not there right now, but I will get it back to them. Um, <laughs> Uh, so don't don't go from here. And she's also pointed out it's actually out of date. There's a new edition, so we will be telling them to get that. Um, you've got the logo production, uh, Beautiful As I Want to Be, um, and some other unnamed projects. We couldn't get it out of her backstage. Um, but anything that you want to share, other sure. things that you you both have coming up as I a closer? I guess follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter, Gender Proud, or our website, genderproud.com. I know I could talk about this now. We have some projects with Fusion um, and Univision uh, talking about um, trans employment in New York City. Um, it's a sort of like a web series. We've been doing a lot of web series, but we have some documentaries that we're producing. And I'm proud to say, you know, 
as a, a trans producer and being the one in control of the narrative, mm -hmm. or at least have something to do about the narrative. It's so important, you know, because for the longest time, I am the subject, right? And you know what happens. You, you never have control. So, but at the same time, you know, when you're producing stuff, you know, you get to bring people with you, right? You take your community and family with you at the same time in, in those projects and making sure those nuance, those complicated stories are being told. So follow us on Twitter and Facebook page, Gender Proud. So. And I'm, uh, my website is MarshaIzumi.com. And I welcome any conversation or you know comments or questions even that you might have after you leave the conference. Um, I'm doing a lot of work nationally right now for the Asian Pacific Islander uh, family acceptance and we're going around the country to a lot of major cities and doing workshops to help families. So if you know of anyone that's interested in this or would be interested in, in attending an event to learn for their family, uh, please email me or uh, get in touch with me on my website and I'd love to to help connect you so one thing I forgot like I this is something I can't forget I'm part of the six hosts on USA Network called Aspirus on TV like I can't forget that right so <laughs> on Sunday at 8 a.m. the producers of 60 Minutes had this new show called Aspirus like what does it look like if 60 Minutes has millennial storytellers so it's okay. every Sunday at 8 o'clock it's called Aspirus so we talk about you know social entrepreneurship and I talk about other things other than be, just being trans and so yeah I'm part of the six house with the people who started the Malala Foundation so USA Network Facebook page Aspirus follow that and if 8 a.m. is too early on Sunday, DVR it. Right? You, can do that <laughs> you, could, oh, we, you could catch it you in catch YouTube it. There we too, go. so yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both for um, be, um, sharing the strength in vulnerability. Again, those go together um, importantly. So can I get another big round of applause for Marsha Izumi and Gina Rosero?